Hi! In the third part of this video series, no new anatomic structures will be introduced. Instead, we will be talking about spaces, about their borders and the communications between them. Traditionally, the middle ear cavity is divided in five compartments, in a manner that looks more descriptive than practical. Everything that can be observed through the external auditory canal by direct view is the mesotympanum. The hidden spaces around that central compartment were named after their location. Anteriorly lies the protympanum, inferiorly the hypotympanum, posteriorly the retrotympanum and superiorly the epitympanum. We'll keep these fundamentals while incorporating the knowledge from the previous videos on the anatomy of middle ear folds. This way, the spaces are further divided in anatomofunctional units linking the anatomy with the physiology of middle ear ventilation. Retraction pockets, colosteatoma spread patterns and selective disventilation syndrome are some of the clinical entities that need this knowledge for deep understanding. A quick run through the most important folds described in the previous video will be useful in setting the basic boundaries of the middle ear spaces. Let's see again the tensor fold, the anterior malleer, the lateral malleer, the lateral incudomalleer, and the posterior incudal fold. The understanding of these five folds is more than enough for proceeding. So, let's start. If we think of the mesotympanum as a compartment that is always in direct communication with the nasopharynx through the Eustachian tube without exceptions, we cluster every possible variation to the epitympanum. This transition can be made by an arbitrary transverse plane, passing from the lateral malleer process to the horizontal part of the facial nerve. From now on, we'll define everything above that plane as epitympanum, or attic. A second plane, parallel to the first, passing from the scutal rim to the medial wall, divides the attic into a superior and an inferior unit. The floor of the superior unit is the tympanic diaphragm. The inferior unit is dedicated to the Prusak space, as we'll see later on. The superior unit is largely divided into a smaller anterior and a bigger posterior compartment. The anterior attic is further divided in two parts. The anterior malleer space lies between the superior malleer ligament and the cog. the anterior epitympanic creases filling the residual space till the root of the zygoma. The size and the ventilation roots of the anterior epitympanum depend on the anatomic variations of the tensor fold. The tensor fold is the boundary between the anterior epitympanum and the supratubal recess, which belongs to the protympanum. When this fold has a more vertical conformation, that means closer to the cog, the anterior epitympanum is smaller, and the supratubal recess bigger. The exact opposite happens when the fold has a horizontal inclination, emerging just above the Eustachian tube orifice. The main ventilation route of the anterior attic passes through the tympanic isthmus. In 25-40% to 40 of normal years, the tensor fold has a deficit in its central part. When this is the case, there is a direct communication between the protympanum and the anterior attic acting as an accessory anterior aeration pathway. Now, let's move on to the larger posterior attic. This compartment is mainly divided in a medial and a lateral unit. The subcompartments of the lateral posterior attic are the lateral malleer space and the superior and inferior incudal spaces. The interrelations of these spaces are largely affected by the variations of the lateral incudomalleer fold, 
in the majority of cases, the lateral malleer space extends over the anterior malleer and the lateral malleer fold. Its floor is the roof of Prusak space and vice versa. The superior incudal space lies just posteriorly, over the lateral incudomalier and the posterior incudal fold. The inferior incudal space is usually a blind pouch between the long incudal process, the interosseous membrane, the lateral incudomalier and the posterior malleer fold. There are three possible ventilation routes towards the posterior lateral attic. We'll refer to them from the most to the least common. When the lateral incudomalier fold inserts to the posterior malleer ligament as a complete mucosal flap, then the only aeration route of the posterior lateral attic is through the tympanic isthmus. The deficit of the posterior incudal fold described by Tauno Palva may contribute to this ventilation route in 25% of normal ears. The lateral incudomal ear fold has an anterior deficit in about 15% of cases allowing the direct communication of the inferior lateral attic with the superior incudal space. This route when present, act synergistically with the tympanic isthmus. In rare cases, the lateral incudomalier fold doesn't have an anterior downslope, but continues anteriorly, inserting to the anterior attic wall or to the tegment. When this is the case, the lateral malleer space is in direct communication with the mesotympanum, through the inferior incudal space. Now, Let's summarize our descriptions by taking two extreme case scenarios. When the tensor fold, the lateral incudomalier and the posterior incudal fold are intact, the only possible way for fresh air to get to the epitympanum is through the tympanic isthmus. On the contrary, when there is a perforation on the tensor fold on the anterior part of the lateral incudomalier and on the posterior incudal fold, the aeration of the epitympanum is much more independent of the tympanic isthmus. All these auxiliary ventilation pathways make the second case less prone to selective disventilation. That's all for part 3. In the next video, we will integrate the roles of Prusak space and von Trestle's pouches to the bigger image. Then, our understanding of the epitympanic aeration will be complete, without grey areas. Now, take some time and try to digest those complicated notions. When you manage to build that 3D image in your mind, everything will look much simpler. Bye, see you in the next part.